Early in its history, the Earth was a vastly different place than the pale blue dot we enjoy today. About 3 billion years ago, or 1.5 billion years after its formation, the Earth was covered by an ocean of water rich in minerals like iron and sulfur, possibly acidic with wild pH variation to alkaline. The atmosphere was richer in nitrogen and CO2 with traces of ammonia, methane and hydrogen but severely deficient in oxygen. The temperature could climb to 60 degrees Celsius in some spots and drop below freezing in others. Yet despite these hellish conditions, life evolved and some bacteria found a way to survive and thrive for hundreds of millions of years. These bacteria were getting their energy directly from the sun by photosynthesis and rejected oxygen as a waste. This oxygen accumulated in the iron-rich ocean had disastrous consequences for the bacteria. Dissolved oxygen can change the oxidation state of iron from plus two soluble to plus three insoluble. We can recreate this early ocean in a beaker. Here, I dissolved some iron two sulfate in water and bubbled oxygen gas in it. After a short while, the color changes from greenish to yellow and brown. An iron-3 oxide is insoluble, a precipitate. On this scale, one second is a million years in reality. I think this makes a simple and easy demonstration of the early ocean great oxygenation event, or GOE. Starved of sunlight, the bacteria stopped producing oxygen until the ocean cleared again, and the process repeat, off and on, and continued until the ocean could not dissolve anymore, and oxygen was free to fill the atmosphere. After 3 billion years, the resulting layer of this oxygenation event can be seen in deposit known as the banded iron formation. Iron from these deposits have been mined for over 200 years and contributed to many human achievements. Steel made possible the industrial revolution, the automobile, and many monuments, bridges, skyscrapers, etc. But how do we really know the age of these rocks and the history of planet Earth? Dating rocks may sound as exciting as a tax form to some, but I personally enjoy the learning experience these projects have taught me over the years. And this one is no different. So thanks to my Patreon, I was able to purchase this rather large banded iron formation sample collected in Minnesota. It displays strong magnetic property hinting at its ferric content. It consists of a succession of dark and lighter band given its name of banded formation. But was it laid in this position or this position? The only way to find out is to date the layers. How? Uranium lead radiometric dating. Lead has four common isotopes, but only one is non-radiogenic, meaning lead 204 is the only true original lead that was created by the rapid process during a supernova before the solar system even existed. The other isotopes of lead, 206, 207, and 208, are exclusively radiogenic and are the stable end results of the decay chain of uranium-238, uranium-235, and thorium-232. This means that most of the lead we encounter in life was once either uranium or thorium. So we have here a perfect way to determine the age of a sample as long as it contains some uranium or thorium. I've explained some of these uh, methods in the radiometric dating video here. If we find some uranium or thorium in a rock sample, we will also find the corresponding lead isotope at the end of the decay series. Lead 208 comes from thorium 232 lead 207 from uranium 235 and lead 206 from uranium 238. Since none of them would exist without their parent isotope, we can make the assumption that for example, all of the lead 206 is 100% coming from uranium 238. The first steps in the dating is to measure the blank. Once the background from the acid alone has been subtracted, we add the measure amount of lead to the uranium quantity to get the original estimated uranium. This is not perfect because of losses from radon easily seeping through rocks and leaving the matrix. But with such a short half-life, these losses are minimal. We can then use this uh, simple equation to determine how long it has been since uranium started to decay in the sample and lead has been accumulating. I collected three pieces of my sample by cutting it with a diamond saw. 
Each were labeled and digested in aqua regia at 97 degrees Celsius for one hour. The solution was then diluted and analyzed for lead and uranium isotopes. Uranium is not as uncommon as you would think, and when looking at proper trillion level concentration, there's a lot of stuff you'd be surprised to find. Before I go any further, let's just agree that this is the top layer and this is the bottom one. Compared to a one part per billion standard, the analysis yielded from about 140 to 430 parts per trillion of uranium and from about 320 to 830 parts per trillion of lead. The top layer of the youngest one was measured at 2.8 billion years and the oldest just under 3.1 billion years old. This is consistent with the accepted uh, reported age of 1.5 to 3.8 billion years and the isotopic ratio of lead confirmed the results. We can now look at the uh, rock again and establish a time frame for all the layers. Each of them are roughly 0.5 centimeters thick and since we now know the total windows of time, the calculation is an easy approximation. Each layer will lay down over an average of 30 million years. And that's what I find very exciting about radiometric dating. But a simple rock analysis revealed the intimate past of a planet in details. Better yet, I looked for iridium in those deposits and found a tiny uptick in the oldest layer, indicating a possible asteroid impact 3 billion years ago. Now what to make with all of this? Well, the dating of the banded iron formation is nothing new. The first speculation and dating date back to 1968 with Preston Cloud. More studies have refined the age of the deposit and process by which it happens. But the general ideas and story have been understood for over 50 years. Again, checking and rechecking the theory is never a waste of time. Our understanding of the Earth's history is sometimes spotty, and these types of analysis helps confirm and refine data. Of course, this is just a weekend project, with no consequences or ambitions beyond entertainment and education value. But research takes time, and the more people are involved, the faster and better the outcome. So, this is probably not your first YouTube video, and you know what to do. Thumbs up if you like it, subscribe if you want, Patreon, bell, share. I hope to see you again on the next one, and thank you for watching. Well, it depends. Heavy metal and hard rock are not that different from each other, right?